Cremona in the Lombardy region of Italy has been a centre of music since the 12th century. In the 1600s it truly came to the fore as the home of many great string instrument makers, Stradivari, Guarneri, Amati, and this prestigious cultural heritage continues with many great luthiers carrying on the tradition here. I travelled across the country from Piacenza where I'm giving master classes on Beethoven's Irish and Scottish folk songs for chamber music students in the conservatorium and I arrived a day early to visit Cremona where my cello was made by Roberto Cavagnoli. When I first tried Roberto's cello, which was my cello to be. I was so thrilled with the power and the resonance that I named it Il Canone. So it's wonderful to meet Roberto again and ask him lots of questions about cello making and hear him talk about his three lockdown cellos. So I'm here in the heart of Cremona with Roberto Cavagnoli and I have come here to this studio, to Roberto's studio, on this lovely day, bit of a grey, cold day. Yes. And I didn't bring my cello, I'm sorry I didn't bring my cello, right. but it would have been nice for you to inspect it. I would love to. Yeah. Nice time, and so if you don't know, I have a cello of Roberto's, which I purchased from him in 2012. Wow. Was it? Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to my workshop. This is my studio. This is where I create my cellos. Um, we are lucky enough today to have uh, three cellos ready and uh, the last one was just put the strings on last night. Oh, nice, okay. <laughs> it's a very, very, very new one. Uh, so basically these uh, babies are uh, born unfortunately or fortunately in the pandemic time. So this is the, the reason why we are lucky to have three of them. This one in the middle was made at the beginning of 2021. The second one over there was made in 2021 as well, and that was made for the three another competition we have in Cremona every three years. Mm. That's why it's called three another. Okay. And uh, this cello was made specifically for the competition, so usually for the competition you choose the best wood you can choose and you take particular care of the making because you have a certain judge uh, judging the craftsmanship and you have the musician judging the sound of it. Okay, so does it take a longer time to build? I admit I started this cello long time ago, uh, three years ago, when the last competition was finished, I just started the cello for the next competition. Yeah. And uh, I just finished the cello in time for the competition and give it someone to play in a little bit before the competition. Uh, I didn't want any prize, but I must admit, uh, looking at the score uh, you, they give you at the end of the competition, it was quite good and almost going to the final step. Okay. It didn't get through because so many different reasons, I don't know, maybe the player, the musician didn't like as much as the other ones he tried. How do you say luthier in Italian? Uh, liutaio. Liutaio. Bravissimo. Liutaio. liutaio, yes. Uh -huh. So, some liutaio yeah. say that um, they don't want to go in the competitions because it doesn't it sort of stilts their work? The competition in Cremona especially wants a brand new instrument. Mm -hmm. and some makers around the world prefer to do antique loop instruments. Oh, so this is just a big thing. And second, it's true that the competition has so many things involved in an instrument that um, it's not fair to judge quickly a uh, hundred instrument and decide which one is the best. Yeah. But uh, because the competition is in Cremona and it's just the window where everyone can see my instrument and see my name, it's a kind of promotion for me. Yeah. And uh, it's also challenging. I mean, I don't mind uh, to participate in the competition and don't have any prize, but look at the score and realize uh, uh, what the judge say about my instrument. I did want some prizes in the past. I did want bronze medal, the third place uh, in the Cremona competition and a few others in the 
one society romantic competition as well. New things of this cello is I uh, usually focus a lot on my Montagnana model, which I've been making since I started my career. And now I love to develop another model, which is this uh, Guadagnini model. And uh, this is really the first uh, Guadagnini instrument cello I made. Okay. The story about this cello is I've been asked to make a copy of the Guadagnini cello, the Australian string quartet play. The process of the making uh, went into a documentary film. Which is Perfect. Making a copy is a very traditional way to learn how another master did it in the past. Put, uh, the making of a copy of the cello. Second cello, let me say, is just a brand new one uh, to develop the, the model. Brilliant. The yes. other two uh, basically are the same model. But because uh, every piece of wood is different, and uh, maybe the arching is a little bit different, and the thickness and everything, of course they will have different sound. And this is what is interesting to try cellos, so to have same model and same maker, but different sound out of it. Where did you get the wood for these? All in the same places? Well, yes, we do have a few dealers that cut wood, especially for money maker. And uh, usually I'm going there around February or March because it's the best time to go there because they're cutting fresh wood. And I love to be one of the first ones to choose the fresh wood because it's also the most beautiful one. Ah, and yeah. you can buy and uh, keep it as long as possible. The spruce is um, the top wood, which is softer. And it's come from Val di Fiemme, which is a valley in Italy. And the maple, which are made uh, for the ribs, uh, sorry, the ribs, the back and the scroll, are from uh, ex Yugoslavia, from Balkan. Okay. And does it have to be harder wood on the back and the, exactly. the strength? Exactly. Bravissima. The back has to be hard because the pressure of the strings does this compression so the back are, is going to be stretched mm -hmm. and the top is going to be compressed and that's why we have hard wood on the back and soft wood on the top because we need to spread the vibration around all the body okay so when it's soft if it was too hard at the front the vibration would stop bravissima but the back and the wood is also important for the sound. For the sound as well, yes, so, yes. Um, so is either one more important? They, they have to work very well together. Okay. And also, the, as we say, the back uh, um, keep the tension of the strings for the hardness, but also give you the pushing of the sound outside the body. They're all the same style. Yes. All the wood is from the same. All the wood is from the era. same era. How long did you save that wood for? Well, at the moment I am using the wood that are from two thousand and seven. Okay. So possibly as old as possible, so fifteen years, ten years, depending. I would buy wood every year, and if, as I say, investment because you have to keep it as long as possible. And you have to take care of the wood as well because every year you have to go there and check every single piece. Uh, nothing goes wrong with the wood, otherwise, you're wasting your time and your money. Uh, what's the sort of environment where you keep it? Well, uh, I'm lucky enough to keep it in a garage where it is not uh, too hot in the summer and not too cold in the winter. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's enough light coming in because that's also important okay. because when it's dark is where the woodworm start to be active. And uh, yeah, so it's a perfect environment to, for the wood. Actually. Yeah, this is your latest just That's my latest, yes, that I'm so curious to hear it, you play. Because it's always an exciting moment to have a new baby just born. And, uh, Working carefully around an instrument for so long uh, is uh, 
makes you somehow attached to an instrument a little bit. Yeah. And it's another big moment when you hear the voice for the first time because uh, uh, what you've done to the instrument comes alive. And that's uh, very, very special, let me say. And did you have anyone play at the edge? No, you will be the first one. So Fantastic. I'm so happy and uh, excited about it. Very good. And you play a bit of cello, do you? I do, I do. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just play the instrument by myself, but it's different when you hear it from a professional yeah. musician. Yeah. Yeah. And do you set them up with the same strings? Like, what are the strings I you did, use? I did set them, them up with the same string. First of all, because uh, it's a uh, Good compromise for starting. Of course, string, as you know, it's a big part of the cello as well. But uh, a trial of them with the same uh, strings gives us the idea of the character of the instrument. Uh, the strings I put in usually are the two Larsen on the top, mm -hmm. uh, possibly soloist edition, and uh, on the lower part we put the uh, spiro core wall from uh, oh, okay. strings. Yeah, okay. And the same with the tail piece and... The like tail piece, uh, it's uh, the result of uh, many different tests mm -hmm. about different tail pieces because also the tail piece uh, can make different result with the sound. And this is the most... Um, how do you say a good one is compromise uh, for lightness mm -hmm. and uh, for good result with the sound. Yeah. Uh, once uh, again, I would say that this is a start. So when you have your cello and it's been played in for a few weeks, a few months, a year, two years, and you are going to have a check, you can always change the tail piece and try a wooden one and see if it makes uh, the kind of sound you prefer and if you're going back to the plastic one. So this is a good uh, mm, start, let's say. Yeah, yeah, okay. And is it that the same with the spikes? Like what the spikes same spike, are uh, the, the spikes, because they are carbon, carbon fiber spikes, mm -hmm. makes, uh, make uh, here in Verona, from a company here in Verona. Um, mm, the spikes, once again, there are so many different kinds of, but uh, I will be happy to start with this one and we can always try a different one when you want. Uh, same for the bridge, uh, I chose Belgian bridge because uh, I want to make uh, everything similar, but uh, I do have a uh, French model bridge up on my bench that I did for this first cello, just if anyone wants to try a different bridge. Yeah. And uh, I did uh, two bridges for the other cello because at a different height. Because usually, um, when you first play, you want to be comfortable, but maybe over the couple of months, uh, there's a little adjustment on the fingerboard and my reach to the lower point of the higher of the string and you need a new bridge so I already cut a new bridge for the cello as well. Okay, and do you, do you like buy a bridge or do you make it from scratch? Do you buy I do home? buy bridges that are uh, uh, already cut. Uh -huh. And what we do is just um, fit the fit of the bridge on the surface perfectly yeah. and do the height yeah. on the strings and the fitness as well as very important and then we start to uh, take off a, a lot of wood here to make the, the legs more thin and nice. legs are be able to, to vibrate so this is the rough bridge and this is the final nice. bridge. Yeah, yeah, lovely. So that's pretty different. Yes, and I see. Some, yeah, some good. work done yeah. in the bridge yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. It's nice. Beautiful. It's so yeah. elegant. <laughs> it's peaceful. You, you go there and with your knife, very sharp, you start to 
We can't, as you say, to not just cut roughly, but give a nice and elegant line. And so, uh, so something nice to see. Roberto, for my cello club people, they okay. have some questions. And you should join the cello club, by the way. I will. That will get you playing. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'll give you a link so you can come Please. in and have a look. Thank and you very much. You'll yes, get you. inspired to play. So, uh, I think this was from Bob. And um, it was about the base bar placement. So does the base bar inside the placement and the shape of it? Like what is the story behind the base bar and where it should go? Well, the base bar is going under the left feet of the bridge. If we look at the cello in front, like yeah. we are going. And this uh, independent piece of wood goes along the top, mm -hmm. inside the top, and uh, actually um, it does help the cello to support the pressure of the strings uh -huh. and to spread the vibration of the mm -hmm. lower string around the body. Okay. Uh, this bar is uh, one of the many little things or big things we have inside the, the instrument or around the instrument that can change the sound. So the first thing is important is to fit the bass bar very well in the, in the, inside the top. And then shaping the bass bar means uh, take of wood to give the bass bar and uh, the possibility to let the, the top vibrate. So you test the base bar uh, just pushing on the two sides when it's already glued to the top yeah. and see the and feel the flexibility of the base bar. Oh. And taking off wood until you are happy with the flexibility because you have to be strong enough to support the pressure but flexible enough to be able to vibrate. Mm -hmm. And it's something that uh, you can just feel it. Okay. Of course, you have certain measurement to follow, but uh, to round the base bar or leave it more um, shape with the angle, it's about uh, choosing of the maker and the experience of the maker. Okay, and do you ever have to like, you put it all in and set it up and then you're like, ah, I'm not happy with the base bar sound, and you have to open it up again? Uh, How many times would you open up a cello? Uh, never. <laughs> It never happened to me, so okay. uh, it's, uh, I know it's possible, uh, it can happen, but uh, um, personally it never happened to me. I always been making and uh, sell my instrument and never came back, so uh, it means that I'm doing good bass bar. Uh, I know I have um, colleagues that sometimes they are not happy with the sound and reopen the instrument. Uh, is something that you can do, mm. uh, but uh, in, in every way. Yeah. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. And the sound post would be also, is that, does that matter about the shape of the sound post? Well, the sound post is <laughs> more about the diameter, diameter mm. of it and, uh, and the length, because the sound post is a cylinder of wood that goes underneath the other bridge, which is the right feet of the bridge if we're still looking at the cello in front. Uh, approximately around this area, but uh, because the, the arching is not flat, so it's curved, um, you have to cut the sound post nicely because you have to match the, the wood perfectly inside. Mm -hmm. And if you move it a little bit around, it will change the position, it will change the tension, and then it will change the sound coming out from the cello. Yeah. And that's very magic. That's something that uh, we can also do today. You can always do it uh, with the right tools. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and this is the first thing you're always doing to adjust a little bit the sound uh, at the beginning. Yeah. Or when the weather changes, because uh, okay. weather is another important thing for cellos, violas and violins as well, as they are made by wood, they are very sensitive about temperature and humidity. And so the, the sound post is one of the first things that 
can release the sound after being stuck in the same place for a few months or a year or something like this. How important is the bow you use as well? On the same thing as the bridge and the strings? Yes, yeah, very important as well. That's and would you use the same bow on each one first? That would be best, of course. Uh, that's why I have here four different bows for you to try because uh, uh, I do have a spare carbon fiber bow, a cheap one just in case, but uh, a good bow is also very important. So I asked my friend uh, Emilio Slaviero to borrow me a few bows to, uh, to try, for you to try. And uh, yeah, so as you know, every bow can make different sounds. So um, bow is an extension of the arms of the player and it's important that fit very well with the player. Mm. And only the player can tell you what's the best bow for him or for her. And uh, so uh, it's just something that you have to try and try and try and find the best one for you. How do you determine the price of your cellos if like if one sounds so amazing, they're all the same time about and would you just price them the same or would you have... No, well, the, the price has to be the same uh, for all of them. Uh, yeah. I'm sure they are all different, but uh, we're talking about more different from the character. Yeah. Uh, Determine the price is about uh, you know starting with something at the beginning of my career and going up a, a little bit every year as normal and uh, and uh, get to the price where I am now. Did someone ever buy your cello? Yes. And then recently they've sold it and they made that they sold it for more than you sold. Well, I, yes, I did have a few occasions when you know the. Customer bought a cello when they were students and, and go on with the career for 10 years, 15 years, and mm -hmm. then uh, had the chance to buy something more expensive or something like this, and they resell it for more. Yeah. And, and that was good. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the varnish, how important is the varnish to the cello? The varnish is very important. Um, I must say that if you have a an instrument without the varnish, it uh, has a very loud sound. Also, it's important for protecting the instrument to preserve from the humidity, from the difference of temperature, and from touching the instrument all around, from the rosin, from the bow. Mm. So, it's very important. Um, the varnish is um, another story that we, as a violin maker, have to learn because it's not just craftsmanship, it's not just uh, playing, but it's also about chemical stuff. And we have to learn and to put together uh, oil and rosin and uh, in the right mix uh, at the right temperature, cook it for the right time and then uh, let it settle and use it at the end. So it's uh, another magic thing, magic and complicated thing that we have to learn. The alchemy of it. Exactly. And do you have a secret ingredient in your varnishes? Every maker has his own technique to put the varnish or his own technique to put the varnish on the instrument and, uh, and even different shoes of what they prefer as a color. So as you can see, those three guys are pretty much uh, same tonal color, uh, slightly different, but this is what I like. So They're quite reddish, it's lovely. Yes. And what's the color from? Is it? Oh, uh, it's a pigment. So you have to put the pigment on the glass surface with the, I don't remember the name, of the testello that you have to to work on the pigment and to, to break the pigment and everything and then right. you put it in the varnish and mm -hmm. you and, uh, and you mix very well and then you put it on the on the instrument. Yeah, right. uh, I'm curious because I did a little bit of adjustment on the arcing and on the thickness and uh, I need to know if these new things are working well. Beautiful sound.
grotey sound. Okay. Yeah. Nice one. Yeah. You need to warm it up as you can hear. Yeah. The beginning yeah. was a really cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, now it's hold my fingers too. <laughs>
much stronger on this one. This, okay. The D strings. Very responsive. I wonder if it's the model or something. Uh, yes. There's almost this tiny bit things that uh, is difficult to find out what what you can point to 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 make it better or, yeah. or the same or something like this. But this is um. So the top string, I think um. You probably could get a sweeter tone on the top string than mm -hmm. on that one. Yes. Yes. Yeah, not really. Okay. Um, and my 
myself because for me six millimeter is not really much. No, and, uh, it's not a lot. Exactly. Yeah. Because when he asked me, it was a weird uh, request. So yeah. I said, okay, I'll do it. I have yeah. no problem. He wants a specific uh, one eight four. Yes. And I said, okay, I can do it uh, just a little bit the the bridge and then make it bigger. Yeah, nuts. A couple of millimeters there. Exactly. And, yeah. But I think it makes your hands a fraction more relaxed. Exactly. Relaxed. Because probably when they are closer, they're more. Uh, <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Cello is a good compromise between uh, the, the full size and uh, for people that uh, you know don't have big hand as me uh, to reach uh, all the position they need to reach on the fingerboard. Um, tell you the truth, the copy of the Guadagnini cello I made for the documentary for the film was actually a 78 because Guadagnini made uh, this cello a tiny bit smaller and uh, so what is my intention is to make again uh, this copy as I can show you the original on this poster oh, lovely. and uh, this is 7-8 this is a 7-8 exactly a tiny bit smaller than, than the full size as you okay. can see oh. So then you resized these for these cellos? Yes, I did uh, use this model and make it bigger as a normal size on that cello because I want to develop the model as a normal size to uh, add my personal knowledge. Mm -hmm. But I must say that this one works very well and I love to make another one and uh, this one. Uh, the particular of this cello is the cut of the back because okay. it's not a normal cut but it's what you call slab cut I guess slab cut. The, mm -hmm. the, the way that you cut the wood and uh, that's why these flames as you can see are a little bit like clouds yeah something like this okay and uh, yeah, and, uh, oh, the, I see. when I did the copy I tried to, to match the color and the shapes and everything nice. so kind of fun and uh, do you have and, a photo of the oh it's in the video we'll have a look at the yes, video yes exactly yeah. and yeah so this will be the next project to have a, a seven eight cello seven. as a guadagnini copy again beautiful monday is always a day off in this region so everything is closed, but it's lovely to soak up the atmosphere as we walk the cobbles and the bellissimi edifici italiani. 